I've been having a hard time putting into words how complex and effective this following scene is from the first episode of Volume 8, so I'll try something different and narrate my thoughts instead. In this scene, we see Yang clearly motivated to say something after hearing Joanna's stern comment towards Weiss, either you're helping or you're baggage. The episode then transitions to a shot of Yang running through the streets, careful to evade detection by roaming Grimm. We don't know if this is a flashback or flash forward, but her statement, we need to get out there and do what we can for Mantle, directly comes into conflict with Ruby's response, we need to do what we can for everyone. These two sisters are the ones leading the conversation, and they're at odds at how best to approach the dire situation. Yang's response leans towards a direct, pragmatic approach to immediately aid the vulnerable citizens, while Ruby, on the other hand, maintains her attempt at the long game to warn the world about Salem, which is immensely high risk, high reward. As Blake voices her support for Ruby in the present conversation, Yang looks down to see the abandoned belongings of a civilian who most likely fled for their life in the chaos. Then there's a match cut to Yang back in the present. That experience in the streets clearly influences or echoes how she feels about the situation. After Pietra states that it's still possible for Amity Coliseum to be launched via one of Ironwood's terminals, Yang voices her opinion that it would still be impossible for the General to cooperate, which Ruby continues to resist by suggesting that there is still some way to bypass him. As Pietra explains that there's more than one terminal, there's a cut to a similar shot of Ruby evading detection by one of Atlas's drones. Both sisters are out in the open, but are facing different foes. This further reflects what they believe the best course of action is, directly at the symptoms, the grim, or the cause, Atlas. Yang continues to point out that Ruby's plan is futile, which earns a sharp rebuke from Ruby. Doing her best to avoid lashing out, Yang very carefully points out that even though Ruby and Orange, Orange? Agreed to follow her lead in the previous volume, but recent events have truthfully been disaster and tragedy back to back. The entire group shudders at these harsh words, powerfully punctuated by Penny's unseen face. Her failure to protect the recently deceased Winter Maiden is painfully fresh. Just as how Ruby and Yang are now showing differences of opinions, Ren comes to the latter's defense. He too has been showing growing signs of alienation from his partner Nora. As this happens, there's a cutback to Yang where Ren promptly arrives. This now reveals that these shots of Yang and Ruby are indeed flash forwards, with each respective camp gaining splintered allies. Nora responds, with her voice eliciting a sorrowful reaction from Ren as he realizes that she won't follow, instead reaching out to Ruby and the other flash forward. There's another match cut back into the present, and Jean has a great character moment of leadership and mediation. It's interesting that he's the first one to put himself between the two camps, as he's the only one without his former partner, Pyrrha. It's a nice recognition of growth. Just as how Ruby came to him in Volume 1 to advise his doubt about leadership, he now proactively steps up to wisely value each differing camp, and ultimately states that both courses of action are equally valid and not mutually exclusive. It's also quite sad to see Penny offer herself up to Salem, which one could tie back to her words in Volume 2, where she talks about how it's her job to protect the people of the world, and now with the crumbling title of Protector of Mantle, she seems desperate to show that it's not a lie. This is promptly shut down by both Oscar and Yang, and although the latter is still upset with Ruby, she clearly knows that the two are close, and thus does offer out an olive branch to her sister by saying, Nobody is turning you over to anybody. I think that's the one thing we could all agree on. In its first episode of a brand new volume, the Kruby has shown how far they've improved over the years in terms of storytelling. The editing and pacing of this episode does a superb job of both heightening the drama and serving the narrative. The use of match cuts effectively ground and connect different non-linear timelines, and when viewed in proper chronological order, they serve as both motivation and validation for its key characters. And this is where the episode truly shines. Its sharp writing reflects the complexities of each individual, showcasing how even though that these characters are all allies on the same side, they still have unique experiences that shape their outlooks and points of view. Their bonds as teammates, siblings, and even budding lovers are not always enough to keep them protected from internal discord and conflict. That harsh reality is both realistic and expected as the cast have endured and survived so much in the last few volumes. Hey, we're still united. I hope so. Me too, Ruby. Me too. Let us take it. Let us, let us take it.